Wednesday, March 25th, 1964. A former professional bank robber who just returned to the city of Chicago after a 25-year stint in prison returned to his old ways, putting together a crew and taking down scores. But a Chicago detective married to his profession would soon become all consumed by the pursuit of the robber and his crew, leading to one of the deadliest law enforcement shootouts in Chicago history and the inspiration for the iconic film, Heat. This is the true story behind the film. Iowa native Neil McCauley was born on February 2nd, 1914. And by the time he reached the age of 48, he'd spent 25 of those years behind bars. And his last eight years were served in Alcatraz, where he spent four consecutive of those years in solitary confinement prior to his release in 1962. He returned to Chicago, the town he once dominated as a professional thief. And Chicago PD detective Chuck Adamson from the city's major crime unit on a hunch kept a watchful eye on McCauley, believing that he would certainly fall into his old habits and continue to do what he does best, putting together a crew and taking down scores. And soon enough, Detective Adamson's hunch proved to be real. As McCauley drafted a small crew and began masterfully robbing various warehouses and armored trucks. But it wasn't until McCauley hit a manufacturing plant outside of Chicago, making out with thousands of diamond drill bits that Detective Adamson would make taking down McCauley his number one priority, even putting together a crew of his own to infiltrate McCauley's crew and run round-the-clock surveillance on McCauley and his men. His next score would take place only days later, and Detective Adamson and his officers observed as Neil McCauley and his crew performed dry runs and conducted stakeouts on the targeted warehouse. McCauley, being the professional he is, left nothing to chance. He'd study the building layout, the parking lot egress, and the volume of cars and foot traffic in the area and at what times, and even mapped out last resort escape routes such as building windows and fire escapes. Detective Adamson, running surveillance in the distance, was surprised just how detailed McCauley was. He spent his career chasing amateurs, low-level felons, ripping off liquor stores, and he knew this time around, McCauley was a different beast and would be a much more dangerous undertaking than being on the end of a poor man's gun. Over the next several days, Detective Adamson assigned officers to stake out the warehouse and stealth cover the exterior of the building 24-7, even assigning two detectives to hide within the warehouse, requesting that neither leave the building, let alone move under any circumstances, no matter how many hours had passed. And McCauley and his crew arrived like clockwork, and one detective having stood still for six hours inside, snuck out of the warehouse to use a bathroom across the street. McCauley heard the commotion from inside the warehouse, and after meticulous planning and a considerable amount of money invested into the heist, McCauley called it off. Officers standing by outside were stunned as they witnessed the crew simply walk off the property empty-handed, having committed nothing but burglary, and Detective Adamson, while frustrated, admired McCauley's discipline. Although McCauley and his crew got off easy, they were far from spooked. And not only were they determined to earn, but determined to find out exactly who was on their tail. McCauley and his crew conducted counter surveillance, staging a stakeout at a generic warehouse, playing the part of the robbers, as McCauley was taking photographs of Detective Adamson and the Chicago PD. Detective Adamson spotted McCauley with his camera and realized they'd been duped. McCauley and his crew fled and drove off into the night. And once again, Detective Adamson couldn't help but admire McCauley's professionalism and dark sense of humor. It seems they shared more in common than either would have thought. And weeks later, in 1963, 
Detective Adamson stopped McCauley on a busy Chicago street and invited him for coffee. Inside a Chicago diner, the two sat down face to face. Detective Adamson had no plan and no ulterior motive. He simply wanted to probe the psychology of his enemy, engage who he was as a person. And around this time, Detective Adamson's personal life was falling apart. He was married to his job, something McCauley could relate to. And because of this personal crisis Detective Adamson was going through, he opened up, purging his personal struggles onto McCauley. Coincidentally, McCauley was experiencing the same issues in his personal life, and together, the two shared a cathartic conversation, admiring one another's dedication to their craft, and discovering they mirrored each other in many ways, even sharing the same motivations which drove them to do what they do. McCauley made it clear that he was determined to never see the inside of a jail cell ever again, no matter what, while Adamson was determined to put McCauley in one, no matter what, and the conversation would end with this bitter taste of reality. Adamson explained to McCauley that there will be a day he takes down a score and he'll be there waiting, to which McCauley responded, explaining that there's a flip side to that coin, where all of that might be true, but maybe he's the one to eliminate Adamson. The two parted ways, declaring they were sure they'd meet again. And one year later, in 1964, Detective Adamson became slammed with robberies taking place at various national tea company grocery stores, with the majority of the robberies netting a score of $10,000 a pop. He was certain it was the work of McCauley and began working surveillance ops on various national tea company chains in Chicago. And like his counterpart, Detective Adamson left nothing to chance and put his money on one particular branch that received cash drops every Friday via an armored truck. And on March 25th, Detective Adamson and the Chicago PD hit around the branch's perimeter as McCauley and his gang tailed the armored truck to the National Tea Company grocery store. The gang entered the store and the robbery commenced. Adamson knew that entering the store to apprehend the men would surely result in a bloodbath, and he ordered his men to take them down as soon as they exited the store. And when McCauley walked out with $13,000 cash, he immediately opened fire on police. Chicago PD returned the favor, immediately killing two of McCauley's crew, but McCauley and his remaining crew members made it to their getaway car and returned fire at police as they drove off, but quickly realized police blocked off all of the city streets and the getaway vehicle crashed into an alleyway. The gang ran into an adjacent neighborhood where Detective Adamson pursued McCauley on foot, and by the time McCauley turned around and realized it, Detective Adamson shot McCauley six times. All but one of McCauley's crew of six were gunned down by Chicago PD, and Detective Adamson knelt beside McCauley as McCauley took his last breath. By the 1980s, Adamson left the police force for Hollywood, taking his longtime friend and former Chicago cop, Dennis Farina, with him. Adamson brought his experience from the streets of Chicago to teleplays such as Miami Vice and screenplays such as Crime Story, of which Dennis Farina starred and Adamson penned. And this is where they met a then young filmmaker, Michael Mann, who was immediately taken by Adamson's story of McCauley and the duality of two men on opposing sides going toe to toe. Farina would go on to star in Michael Mann's Manhunter, but Michael Mann would later turn Adamson's story into a script. Still making a name for himself, Michael Mann was forced to shoot Adamson's story as a TV movie in 1989 titled LA Takedown, which took only 40% from his original and more ambitious script, as attempting his actual vision on a limited TV budget would be a complete waste of time and material. After LA Takedown, Michael Mann's next film, The Last of the Mohicans, was a major success, not only for Michael Mann, but for Warner Brothers, who greenlit his script. Al Pacino was cast to play the role of a character based off of Detective Adamson, while Robert De Niro would play Neil McCauley. And instead of being a Chicago period piece taking place in the 60s, it was set in present-day Los Angeles, a city with a looming presence that was written as a character in its own right. By 1994, the hype around this movie was unprecedented, as for the first time in cinematic history, Al Pacino and Robert De Niro were to share the same screen for the very first time. And Val Kilmer reportedly said no to a project offering him $7 million to secure a role in Heat for only $400,000. Michael Mann asked Val Kilmer what he could do to repay him, to which Val Kilmer requested 
that he be placed between Pacino and De Niro on the poster. Former SAS operator Andy McNabb consulted the cast, training the actors on weapons and tactics, while Michael Mann spent several weeks doing ride-alongs with the LAPD. And it's this ultra-realistic, melancholy tone that makes Heat one of the greatest movies of all time. Definitely the greatest shootout sequence of all time. And it was this journalistic level of research that made the film so unique. And it's one of the many, many reasons why Michael Mann is my favorite filmmaker of all time. Also the greatest movie ending of all time, in my opinion. Between the score, the static shot of Pacino and De Niro, it's perfect. Michael Mann recently co-wrote a novel with Megan Gardner titled Heat 2. And I highly recommend you guys give it a read. Hey guys, if you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit that subscribe button. I'm going to get back to writing my screenplay. If you want to learn more about that, check me out over on Instagram. But other than that, I'll see you guys in the next video. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.